Hi to everyone who's just arriving. Just going to give a little bit of time for everyone to get sort of logged on and, and comfortable. Um, I know that because we often, well, we, we are recording this session. Sometimes people wait for the, the YouTube version, so that's absolutely fine. Um, but I'm just going to give it just a little bit of time to make sure that those who are coming have arrived. As um, standard procedure, so to speak, uh, this is a webinar, so I can't unfortunately see all your wonderful enthusiastic faces or hear you if you were to say anything. Um, so if you have anything that you would like to say, like where you're watching from today, maybe how long you've been doing the scheme for or anything like that, then do feel free to use the chat. Rachel is monitoring that in the background. Equally, if you've got any questions that you would like to ask, um, we're going to have a little question and answer session at the end, in which case um, you can use the Q&A function for those or you can put them in the chat and Rachel will make a note of them and hopefully we can answer all of your questions. So what we're going to try and cover this lunchtime um, is a bit of a closer look at the fine habitat uh, dry deciduous woodland. Um, and hopefully we're going to just sort of do a little bit of a, a, an overarching how it sort of fits in to the broad habitat, how you might apply all of that information to your actual surveys. And then we're going to look at um, some species in more detail, but not all of them, because we would be here all afternoon. Um, so hopefully I've picked out some that will be quite useful to you. Right, so let's begin. Once my computer's notice that I've started. So as I was saying, we're looking at the NPMS broadleaved woodland is the broad habitat category, but we're going to be just looking at one of the fine habitats within that. So what habitats do we have within that broad habitat and how does it fit together? So we have our hedgerows is one. Now, um, I like to think that most people can recognise when they've got a hedgerow, they would um, know that it's a hedgerow and whether it's NPMS survey worthy, which basically means it needs to be semi-natural. So your big sort of laurel hedges around the edges of people's um, gardens aren't going to really fit. The other fine habitat within this broad habitat category is wet woodland. Um, and finally, after a little bit of tech failure um, in the last couple of weeks, I finally have managed to upload the habitat habituation video on wet woodland and that is now on our YouTube channel. So do go and have a watch of that if you would like to know more about wet woodland. But today we are going to focus on dry deciduous. So that's the one, the topic of today. So question is, what is dry deciduous woodland? So essentially with NPMS, we're looking for natural or semi-natural woodland. Um, and that is essentially what it is but it's usually on free draining soils that are either sort of acidic to calcareous or somewhere in between. But it's the free draining element because the fact that they are dry. I mean, it obviously means if you're going to have a lot of heavy rain, you're still going to potentially have puddles and mud. Um, it just means that the, um, the floor of the woodland isn't completely saturated with pools and lots and lots of wet elements to it. The canopy of the trees is usually over five metres tall. Obviously, if it is a young community woodland that's recently been planted, then that might not be the case. Usually, the canopy includes native broadleaved species. So your uh, oak, your ash, and obviously we've got multiple species of oak, birches, rowans, limes, um, hornbeams, wild service tree, all sorts of our lovely native tree species. However, there usually are some non-natives present. So we often find that we've got some sycamore or even beech, maybe in a different part of the country where it wouldn't have been. Things like horse chestnut, sweet chestnut, that sort of thing. They are usually ones that have been planted at some point um, and with sycamore has um, sort of self-regenerated. But that's the sort of thing you can also find in this type of woodland. The shrub layer, uh, so the understory, is normally made up with native sort of scrubby or shrub species. So your hawthorns, your blackthorns, elder, uh, hazel, obviously is a very common one, um, and a sort of mix of that sort of thing. You can also get native and non-native conifers throughout some of our dry deciduous woodlands. 
So you might find that you've got, depending on where you are, some juniper or some Scots pine um, dotted throughout, especially if you are sort of towards Scotland or in Scotland, um, but the majority of it is broadleaved. Um, also, you might think, find things like larch and um, Corsican pine and that sort of thing in amongst the rest of the trees. But what we are not including in this category are ornamental woods or commercial plantations. So most people are familiar with the commercial plantations of um, coniferous um, that are all in nice rows and um, obviously it's there being farmed as a tree species or ornamental woods that are maybe um, have been created in the grounds of a big country house or that sort of thing. And it's a real mishmash of non-natives and natives. So that, that sort of ornamental woodland, different though from a community woodland or a planting scheme that is there for nature benefit, that is slightly different. So you obviously, one of the things that we always ask you to record on is the kind of management that might be going on um, in your plot. And when it comes to woodland, there are a few things that you might notice are happening. So you could have coppicing, um, which is traditionally done on hazel. Um, and it might be that that's an old coppice and it hasn't been done recently, or maybe it's some new coppicing regimes that people are introducing. Uh, other species can be coppiced as well. Um, some of the lime species, uh, like small leaf lime, uh, can be coppiced, um, sometimes birch, that sort of thing. So it's not always hazel. Maybe there's just generally some thinning or felling going on in the wood to open it out a little bit. And maybe they're removing that dead wood. Um, these are all really interesting and useful bits of management information. And if none of it is going on within your exact plot, it still might be useful to write some of this down in the additional comments if you know that some of this management is happening throughout the wood. Scalloping is essentially where um, along a woodland ride or a big widened um, path within a wood, they, um, people want to create slight glades or bits on the side of the path and that's called a scallop and that will be where they fell some trees to allow some of the ground floor to sort of do better. It's particularly um, beneficial for some of our woodland butterflies. It might be that there's some replanting going on, um, some underplanting, that sort of thing. Um, of native or maybe non-native trees. So it's just worth keeping an eye out for that. Um, and then obviously you're not gonna get your sort of big areas of sheep grazing and that sort of thing, but there could be browsing or grazing by um, local deer populations, um, muntjac or, or roe deer, that sort of thing. Um, or even maybe there's some access into the wood by cattle, in which case, you know, you might see some evidence of that through sort of their dung or just the way that they're browsing, or you can actually physically see the access itself. So when uh, maybe you need to consider recording in another category is worth taking into account. So if the wood is made up of mostly coniferous species, now, if you're south of Scotland, that's probably going to be plantation that's essentially had an influx of broadleaf regeneration or where they've got a replanting scheme. Um, but if the majority of it is still coniferous species, then you might not want to consider setting up a plot there. If, however, there are parts of it that are broadleaf um, uh, and the other parts are coniferous, then maybe you could set your plot up in the broadleaf part only. Um, obviously, if you're in Scotland and it's mostly coniferous species, then you might be looking at our native pine woods and juniper category. So it's just worth bearing that in mind. If your tree composition is almost entirely of some of our wetter species like alders and willows and possibly even some downy birch, that sort of thing, and you've got a very, very wet substrate on the, the woodland floor, um, then maybe you might be looking at something like wet woodland. Um, as with all things in nature, nothing is neatly compartmentalized, and it could be that you actually have a woodland that comprises some wet elements to it in certain parts and some that are dry. So it's worth just bearing in mind that you don't want to set up plots that are kind of crossing over between two habitat types. So some examples specifically of where you might find some dry deciduous woodland. So uh, we're quite lucky in this country that we have some amazing ancient woodlands. Um, so maybe it is an ancient woodland site, in which case, you know, it's likely to be a good, a good option for setting up a dry deciduous woodland plot. 
maybe it's a community woodland. Oh, sorry, I went back to that. Uh, let me just go back. Yeah, so maybe it's actually just a real fragment of woodland, in which case people might refer to it as the spinny or the copse, um, or maybe it was used for just coppicing for hazel and it's just a fragment that's left, or maybe it was always small um, or for pheasant rearing, that sort of thing. These are all ones that could still be included because they're semi-natural as a plot for NPMS. Uh, maybe it's a farm woodland as well. So a farmer specifically um, grown it um, for shelter and, and it's broadleaved then you can include that. And the same with community woodlands or um, sort of mitigation for development, that sort of thing. If there are native broadleaf species and it's been done for the benefit of wildlife, then you can still include it. The sort of likely woodland assemblages that you might come across, um, bearing in mind, again, being nature and nuance and everything being potentially in different stages of succession and that sort of thing, um, and having huge varying topography and soil type across the British Isles, you can get differences between these. But generally speaking, you can sort of lump dry deciduous into sort of these three categories. You're going to get maybe your oak, your bracken and your bramble as sort of one of those typical um, habitat types. Um, and that doesn't mean that you only have oak, bracken and bramble. It means that that is uh, sort of one of some of the main elements to it, but it still might be full of other ground flora species, um, understory species, and other canopy tree species as well. Um, the oak, bracken, bramble is usually more on the sort of neutral to calcareous or sort of a range of richer soils usually. Um, whereas things like the sessile oak, um, with the downy birch and the wood sorrel, that sort of thing is likely to be slightly more acidic. Um, so depending on where you are in the country. And then you might have your beech woodlands, which again can often be slightly more on the acidic side, but you can have sort of variations between all of these. But remembering that if you've got something that's very willow or alder dominated, then it's likely it might be one of the wet woodlands. And if you've got anything with um, native pine, uh, then you're likely to be in the native pine wood and juniper category. So it's worth bearing in mind. So another one that actually does fit into dry deciduous, um, but it's not deciduous, so just a little bit confusing, are our native yew woodlands. Um, so not a, a common one that you're likely to come across, very scattered distribution really, um, but they would still be included in the dry deciduous fine habitat. So yew woodlands tend to occur on shallow and dry soils, hence why it's in the dry category, um, particularly on sort of chalk or limestone. Um, where I grew up down in West Sussex, uh, there was some amazing yew woodlands uh, in uh, Kingley Vale um, on the sort of chalk hills of the South Downs. So that was a, a good example. Um, yew is usually the dominant tree species um, rather than a sort of real mix, but it's not always the case. And underneath, there's a very sparse shrub layer and also a very sparse ground flora as well, because as anyone who's been underneath yew trees, they really do block out the light. So there's lot, not a much on the ground flora. If there would be, it's often likely to be dog's mercury. Um, and sometimes the reason that these yew woodlands occur can be where you've got a mix of yew and beech or beech woodland with some areas of yew that's quite sort of clustered and then maybe some beech is felled or it's old and it's fallen and it's died. And then the yew kind of gets a bit of an opportunity to uh, dominate a particular area. So you could have patches of yew woodland within beech woodland potentially. Um, generally speaking, the more northerly locations have some associations with ash and elm rather than, um, and that was going to be witch elm, uh, because obviously Dutch elm disease kills us off all our English elm when it gets to a certain level of maturity. Um, and overall, as I said, the UK location is sort of quite scattered and mainly on those calcareous substrates. So that is why U is also included, because it actually has a similar sort of assemblage with the dog's mercury and other things underneath it, rather than lumping it in with our native pine woodlands. So when is the best time and how to do your survey? So these are some of the quite important things that it's worth going over. So really important to note is that if you're doing dry deciduous woodland, then if possible, 
we would love it if you could do a 10 by 10 meter plot, not your standard five by five meter square. Um, and that is purely because uh, there's a lot more obviously to take in with the woodland with all the trees. Um, and it, it seems to just work best in terms of methodology. Um, if, for example, you've got just a strip of woodland um, and you can't fit a 10 by 10 meter into it, then maybe you could consider doing a linear plot, but just making sure that your fine habitat is noted down as being dry deciduous. So one of the questions um, on the form that you will have noticed is how wooded is your plot? So in nearly every single circumstance, if you've, you've got the fine habitat dry deciduous, it's likely that your answer is going to be the dense tree and or shrub cover. Now, this can sometimes get confusing because you can look above you and think, well, hang on a minute, there's a tree there, but there's not a tree there. And, you know, it's not not really regimented and dense. But if you look up and you can see that the canopy of the trees are basically kind of almost touching each other and there's very little sort of light coming through or big gaps or big clearings, then it's likely to be dense tree and or shrub cover. The scattered trees and shrub is more relating to potentially if you have an area of grassland that's got the odd tree in it or a bit of scrub, or you've got a very, very open woodland with lots and lots of clearings. So most of the time you're going to be wanting to choose the dense tree and or shrub cover. You'll be pleased to know that uh, there's only two grass species that we've listed um, within sort of indicator and wildflower level together um, to identify and only one sedge species. Um, so we, we do try and make sure that there aren't too many of those really tricky species to identify. There are a total of 20 species to identify if you're doing it at wildflower level. And there are an additional 10 species if you are doing it at indicator level. So if you're recording at indicator level, then you've got a total of 30 to record and only 20 if you're recording at wildflower level. So when is the best time? So, I mean, it's really up to you when you want to do your surveys early summer and um, you know late spring, early summer and later on in the summer for your second visit. But if you've got quite a lot of woodland plots within your square or um, they can, you know, you've got a lot of hedgerows and woodland, then the best time to do your first survey might be around the late April, May time anyway, because that's a really good time for woodlands. It's when a lot of those indicator species will actually be out and flowering and easier to identify. Equally, if you've got grassland within your plot and you don't want to be going out and doing them at different times, then just try and find that date that seems to sort of match for both or suits you. Or if you want to, you can go out and do some of your plots at a different time if it suits it. So vegetation, height and percentages. So this is one of the things that can sometimes get a little bit uh, confusing. Um, so it's just worth briefly us just going over it again with woodland um, in mind. So just to go over this again, which I know Rachel has done on some of the excellent um, methodology ones, but just to remind everyone that there are two boxes for your vegetation height. And that is because one is for your first visit and the second one is for your second visit. Um, the vegetation height is really important when you're doing woodland. It excludes the canopy layer. So when we've got the above 300 centimetres here, we're not asking for you to put the percentage cover of the tree species that are creating that top canopy. That's going to be more like for your understory. So your things like your hazel, um, your hawthorns, your blackthorns, that sort of thing. And remember, it doesn't have to add up to 100% because all of these things are growing in different layers. And so you don't need everything to add up to 100%. And also really important, it's only an estimate. And that's why we've got that bracket, uh, for example, sort of one to 33%. That's quite a broad range of percentages um, and the same all the way up. So it doesn't matter if you think, oh, what if I get this wrong? Um, it's just best guess. So some of the species that we're going to cover um, today, that are, we're going to first of all focus on those that are at the wildflower level, and then we're going to do the ones that are just at the indicator level. Now, I've chosen these particular six species to cover first because I believe they are quite um, regularly seen in dry deciduous woodland. You don't have to have triple SI level woodland in order to see these. These are quite common, um, but at the same time, they're ones that perhaps you might not be 100% familiar with. 
Some of them you might be, um, I mean, you know, it just depends on your level of experience, but I thought that these would be some good ones to cover. So we're going to start, first of all, with the wonderful woodruff. Um, I've always known it as sweet woodruff, but in our guides and in an, uh, Francis Rose book, it's just woodruff, um, but you might have heard it referred to as sweet woodruff. It's actually one that I have growing in my garden, so you can buy it from garden centres and it's becoming ever more popular as people try and grow more sort of native wildflowers. So Galium odoratum is the Latin, um, but most of the time I'm going to refer to the common names, if that's okay with everyone. Um, but obviously in our guide, it's listed down in Latin name order. So you might, it might look familiar um, if you've never come across it before because it's the bed straw family, the Galiums. Um, so the same family as our cleavers, or some people might know it as goose grass. Uh, but basically the one that you throw at your mates and it gets stuck on the jumper. So it's exactly the same family as that. And it, I haven't actually tested this. It does smell nice, but whether it's vanilla scented might be down to the in individual. But essentially, if you were to get some of it and crush the leaves, then it has a sort of nice vanilla scent to it. We have It has the four angled stems, which you would find on cleavers as well. Um, and that just means if you were to cut it in half, you could see it would be sort of a square in cross section, essentially. The leaves are arranged in whorls, just like all of those in the bed straw family um, of usually six to eight actual leaves. And each leaf individually is rounded lanceolate. So essentially that just means it's sort of, it's not a straight rectangle or very, very narrow. It's sort of got a rounded feeling to it, but it's still sort of long and thin and it's got a point at the end, and it's hairless. There are forward pointed prickles along the edges of the leaves. So this would be if you got your hand lens out um, and wanted to look at the leaf in more detail, you would see that there are um, pointed prickles and they're pointing forwards along the edges of the leaves. Um, but overall, because it's generally quite hairless and it doesn't have hooked hairs, it isn't sticky like goose uh, cleavers at all. Um, so it just has that subtle pointed prickles along the edge. The flowers are what is described in an umble like head because obviously it's not an umbellifer, it's um, a bed straw, but they're sort of all at the top of the plant in this little cluster and they're rather pretty and they're quite large white flowers in comparison with cleavers or even hedge bed straw and some of the others. It generally prefers rich or calcareous soils, so you're unlikely to find it in those are very acidic and in fact if you do find a very small uh, bed straw like plant in a very acidic woodland it's almost certainly going to be heath bed straw over the top of sweet woodruff. So the first of our grasses and it's the only grass in, to be done in um, wildflower level but thankfully it's an incredibly obvious one it really does look very distinctive um, that's if it's flowering of course when it's just the leaves it's slightly more tricky, although even then the leaves have a certain sort of way about them that really sort of makes you think, ah, yes, no, that's soft and it's nice, that's wood melic. So Melica uniflora. So it's patch forming rather than uh, creating tufts or tussocks. Um, and as you can see in the photo here, it has formed this patch on this bank, um, looking rather beautiful in the sunlight. The leaves are really bright green um, sort of a, a yellowy bright green um, and you can really see that in comparison with the other grass that we're going to talk about in a bit, um, wood millet, which is more sort of bluish glaucous green. Uh, this has got a nice yellow uh, bright green to it, similar to that of false brome, but probably more softly downy than um, soft uh, false brome. False brome is quite obviously hairy. Uh, so this is just a close up of the sort of flower heads and all the spikelets there. So it's sparsely hairy above on the leaves. So quite feels quite soft to touch. And the sheaths, so that's where the leaf wraps around the stem of the grass before it comes out, becomes a full leaf, is again sparsely hairy and a sort of purplish green tinge to it. The glooms are purplish brown. So each one of these little blobs here is a spikelet. And at the base of every spikelet, there are a pair of leaf-like bracts or well, sort of 
they are just little membranous bracts known as glooms and they are a sort of purplish brown which gives them this sort of brownish appearance um, with a sort of greener tip to it. Um, one of the interesting things about this, and this is another way you could potentially tell what it is um, without the flowers, is that the apex of the sheath, so the sheath is the bit that wraps around the stem of the grass, on the opposite side to the leaf blade, so you have the leaf blade coming out one side, on the opposite side there is a slender bristle. Now I've drawn it here so that it's sort of poking outwards, but quite often it might be lying flat against the actual stem of the grass, but it's quite, you know, next time you see wood melic, it might be worth just having a look at it in more in more detail and seeing this little um, bristly apex. So moving on to dog's mercury here. Um, I have a funny uh, sort of bit that I do with my husband whenever we go out in the spring uh, because he gets very confused between dog's mercury and enchanter's nightshade. And every year I point out dog's mercury and I say, which one's this? And every year he says enchanter's nightshade. So we have a little funny ditty that we do when we're looking for this plant. It's not the most interesting of our forest floor dwellers because its flowers are green and the leaves are green. Um, but on mass, it can look quite pretty because its flowers are quite delicate and small. It's actually um, a member of the Spurge family, but doesn't really look like it at all because it's so much more sort of leafy like rather than Spurges sort of have very rounded and almost fleshy look to them. It's uh, sort of hairy, but not so obviously hairy that you could, you know, see the hairs in this photo. But if you were to feel it, you could feel that it is hairy. The leaves are opposite each other on short stalks. So they're not clasping the stem. They have got their individual um, stalks and they are opposite each other, not alternate. Each leaf has small teeth. You can make out in this image here, just very nice and neat very small little uh, teeth so it's not entire which means that it wouldn't have any teeth or lobes at all it has those little bumpy teeth the uh, in one of the interesting things about this plant is that the male and female are separate so it has separate male and female plants and flowers um, and again we've said the flowers are sort of quite nondescript they are catkin like as one of the descriptions in the books uh, I've got a close up image here, you can just see um, how basically they've reduced to not really having separate um, petals and uh, sepals, they've more got these, these sort of combination of the two called tepals, um, and they're very sort of basic and small and not very obvious at all. Uh, but interestingly, the flowers um, are born on these long stalks um, in the leaf axles, so that just means where the leaf is coming out from away from the stem that's where you get the flowers coming from. Now, this one is one of my probably favorite ones when I'm teaching um, woodland botany to anyone because it very much looks like chickweed, but there's one really, really easy way to tell that it's not, which we'll go on to. So three nerved sandwort. Now this one is a small plant, so you're going to need to make sure that you're sort of looking really closely at the ground flora. Um, and maybe checking underneath some of the other plants in case it's there. It's a member of the Campion family, so our sandworts. It, as I said, it's a small plant. It's slightly downy. I mean, you can see in this uh, photograph how it's, you can see the hairs on it. But it is very, very similar to chickweed. And I've just got a photo of chickweed here just to show you it, how sort of similar the look of the plant is generally. A couple of things that are really, really key here. Uh, the first is in the leaves, which is quite helpful if some of the, the, the often with these sandwort type plants, as soon as you pick it up or pick a bit of the flower to look at it in more detail, all the petals fall off and then you're like, oh, I haven't got anything to look at now. Um, but one of the things is that there are three strong veins in the leaves, which are unlike chickweed. So this is your three nerved sandwort. I mean, the key is in the name there, three nerves. And they form that sort of very distinctive three of them, one in the middle and two on the outside. Whereas the veins on chickweed are much more like that of your sort of traditional leaf that you draw with the net veins. The other thing it's worth noticing is that the petals themselves are unnotched, whereas in chickweed they are notched. Moving on to the lovely wood sage now. Um, so this one is a member of the dead nettle family. Um, 
not as obviously one a member of that family when you first look at it actually but when you start to look at it in more detail you can see the similarities it's a generally downy plant so again it's got hairs and it's got oval leaves with chordate bases and again the sort of terminology of oval some of them are more sort of oval lanceolate um, so there's some variability there uh, and a chordate base essentially so it's crude drawing here but it essentially means it's almost got like a heart shaped base to it uh, where the stalk is inserted you can't see it in this image some of the ones further up almost look like they're clasping the stem and it doesn't help because also it's very crinkled and wrinkly so you can't almost get the full outline of the base but it has these chordate bases so as i said the leaves are sort of wrinkled they are stalked and they are blunt toothed but the wrinkledness is really obvious it sort of reminds me of um sage or something which obviously is a wood sage so it looks very similar in that sense the flowers themselves are in these loose leaflet leafless spikes sorry that's a bit of a tongue twister um which might seem a bit strange because when you read that as a description and then you look at some of the images you're like well hang on a minute i can see some little leaves coming out in amongst those flowers there so how could it have a leafless um spike with the flowers on and we'll get to that in a minute. The flowers themselves are in opposite pairs all the way up the stem. But now this is where those little leaf-like structures just come in there to confuse us. Um, they are actually just bracts. So they're not leaves at all. They're um, leaf-like structures known as bracts. And they are very small, but they are there in amongst the flowers. The corolla, which is just the name for the actual flower part, is like a pale, greenish yellow yeah as you can see from this photograph and it really likes dry woodlands obviously we're in dry deciduous um, but it also can appear in grasslands dunes and heaths as well but generally speaking it does not like calcareous soils so this is one that you're more likely to find in those slightly more acidic soils so now we have a sort of grouping of two plants together common dog violet and early dog violet um, and we've grouped them together because uh, it's just easier for recording purposes, um, uh, because there are differences between the two species, obviously, but they can involve quite a lot of sort of really checking some smaller, finer details. So as a group, these two are typical violets. Um, they are, you know, they look, you'd see them and you think, well, that's a violet. They're unscented, so that's key um, to separate it from, well, one of the keys to separate it from sweet violet, so it's completely unscented, both of them. And they have that typical violet leaf shape, um, sort of that slightly heart shape. Um, ignore the ones down in the bottom here that are lesser celandine, but you can just see some there. Um, they are that classic violet blue color. Um, so, you know, you're likely to see them in that kind of color, and they've got that sort of spur coming off. Now, interestingly, as an aside, early dog violet um, tends to have a purple spur, whereas common dog violet tends to have a yellowish one. But again, we don't need to split them for the survey. But then what we do need to know is how they are not sweet violet, hairy violet or heath dog violet, which are our other sort of more um, other common violets. So firstly, sweet violet is quite likely to be one that you might come across in some of these habitats. Um, so it is fragrant and it's closely downy, um, but that means that it's hairy, but it's like they're very, very short and it just gives it a sort of soft feel to it. Unlike hairy violet, which has long spreading hairs. Um, and also the key with sweet violet is the leaves get bigger and bigger and bigger throughout the season. So the flowers are finished but the leaves just keep growing. So you can end up with some whopper violet leaves um, and that's sweet violet. And sometimes with sweet violet, you also get white flowers um, just here. So they almost look like somebody's planted them, um, but this is just a, a sort of natural occurrence. And here's a good image of hairy violet with those spreading hairs all along the flower stalk and the leaf stalks. Heath dog violet, not as common, I would say, or at least it's more really attributed to that typical heath habitat. Um, they're hairless completely, and also their leaf shape is slightly different with sort of oval to lanceolate shape, so much narrower heart shape, and their spur is a yellowish green as well. But again, if you're out on a heath somewhere and you see some violets there, then it's quite likely it could be heath dog violet. 
there is one more species here that well not one more but other one that you might find in some woods um and that is marsh violet but it's so different from the others you're unlikely to get it confused the violets are very very pale flowered almost sort of um a sort of pale blue lilac color and the leaves are very very rounded um heart shapes as well so that was all of the species for the wildflower level so now we're just going to go through an additional four species that are for indicator level only, which it might be that you're watching this thinking, oh, no, I'm 100% I'm, I'm going to stick to wildflower level, which is great. You know, that's absolutely fine. We want you to get confident. But maybe at some point you can rewatch this section just for those additional species that will just take you up to that ne next level, because that's something we really want to encourage you to be able to do and feel confident to do. So we're going to cover the only sedge that's in the whole um, indicator list, wood sedge, um, and then the, uh, another, the other grass that's within it and a couple of others. Again, I've chosen species that I feel like are likely to occur within your plots, um, but are not so, so obvious that you can easily you know, identify them from your ID guide. So something that might be a little bit trickier. So the only sedge we have in here is wood sedge, Carex sylvatica. So it's really, really common, first of all, so you're likely to find it in all woodland types, whether you've got a really wonderful ancient woodland or sort of more of a uh, slightly more sort of urban outskirts woodland. They're tufted, so that's just a lot of sedges there, they form that little tuft. The flower stems themselves are very slender and sort of nodding with the weight of the flowers. And the leaves are, again, another one that are very bright yellow green. Um, so not really dark or slightly bluish. They are very yellow green. The ligules, if you wanted to pull apart and have a look at where the leaf comes in at the stem, the ligules on sedges are slightly different from grasses in that they're sort of usually lying flat against um, the, the leaf blade itself. But they are long and rounded if you wanted to look. And the lower bract, which is essentially um, an additional leaf-like structure that usually sits below um, the flowering part of the plant is quite leaf-like. So it would look pretty much like another leaf, whereas in some species it might be more bristle-like or hair-like. Uh, as with all sedges, you have your, well, not actually, as with all the true sedges, the carexes, you've got your separate male and female spikes. So you've got your one male spike at the very top, and then you've got about three or five female spikes. So that is quite important because um, some of the Carex species might have maybe two male spikes at the top, but wood sedge only has the one male spike at the top. The flower spikes are well separated. They're not all clustered together at one bit at the top of the plant. They're quite separated out on long, slender, pendulous stems. So essentially it looks like a mini pendulous sedge. If you're familiar with pendulous sedge, which I know I am because I've got it growing everywhere in my garden and it's seeds everywhere, um, then this is just like a smaller version of that. Um, and just for the sake of it, I've just shown you, this is what pendulous sedge looks like. So it's a, min a mini version of this is wood sedge essentially um, with slightly shorter sort of um, female spikes. Moving on to Spurge Laurel, a rather lovely species. Um, it is a Daphne, as you'll see from the Latin. Um, and so for any of you keen gardeners out there, you'll know that Daphnes are usually really, really fragrant and lovely. Um, and this one is fragrant also. As you can see from the photo, it's hairless, very, very shiny, and it is an evergreen shrub. So, you know, it's not a sort of little herbaceous small plant. This is kind of can get quite chunky. Um, and its leaves are sort of leathery and lanceolate. And they tend to form in almost whirl-like arrangements um, like that, which means it has a real feel of rhododendron about it, but nowhere near as big, um, but still has that sort of look to it. The flowers themselves are green and they are born in the leaf axles. So again, where the leaves are coming out from the stem, that's where you're getting the flowers rather than atop, you know, a big um, stem. The fruits, if you find them, they're long, black, oval and fleshy. And this is a species that tends to really like those calcareous soils. So not one that you're going to get in all woodland types. Um, it, it, 
especially if you've got the sort of more acidic woodland, it's not likely to occur there, whereas it does like those calcareous soils. So then our second and only sec uh, the, the last grass species that's within this fine habitat is wood millet. Um, it's one of my favourite grasses. That This and wood mellic just dotted through a woodland just look absolutely stunning, really do. It is a really tall grass, so up to 180 centimetres. It's quite statuesque. It's got quite a presence to it. Um, but you'll see that the flower, the actual inflorescences, they're very delicate, um, sort of very thin stems with the spikelets sort of drooping. Um, so it, it kind of doesn't, it's not in your face. It's got a real delicate feel to it. It's glabrous, which just means it's not, it's not hairy. Um, so it's quite a lot of our woodland grasses are often quite hairy. Uh, it's got really long ligules, which again is that little membranous bit um, at the base of the leaf that's against the stem, if you were to pull it out slightly. As you can see, the structure of the inflorescence is a panicle, which means you've got stems um, for the, the actual sort of uh, flowering parts, but they're in, arranged in a whirl like all the way up. So it's a whir open world panicle. The spikelets themselves are pale green. Um, they don't tend to sort of change much color other than going maybe a bit dry towards the end of their life. And they are one flowered. And the glooms are more or less equal in length, whereas in a lot of grass species, you get one uh, pair of one part of the pair of glooms, which is much bigger than the other bit. And it has a real sort of millety look to it. This sounds a bit silly, but if you've ever seen millet growing anywhere, then it really does have that, that look about it. And just to remind anyone, if I've used some terminology that you weren't familiar with, the spikelet is the flowering unit of the grass, which actually consists of the pair of glooms at the base and one or more florets. In this species, it's just one floret. And the glooms are those pair of membranous bracts surrounding the spikelet of the grass at the bottom. And you can see in this diagram, they are slightly unequal, whereas in wood millet, they would be quite equal in length. So then wood speedwell, one of my uh, favourites, actually, um, partly because, it, again, it's another one that looks really, really, really similar to a very common plant, Germanda speedwell, but we've got a really easy way of telling the difference between the two. So, as I said, very similar to Germanda speedwell, but instead of uh, having a sort of punk hairstyle strip of hairs either side of the stem, we've got the hairs distributed evenly all the way round. They're not in two single rows like they are on Javanda. So, um, you know, it can be worth checking out all of the plant if you're trying to work that out, um, because in some cases, or even on Javanda Speedwell, the very tips of the flower stalks can sometimes have more evenly distributed hairs, whereas the main part of the stems will have those two rows of hairs. Whereas on Wood Speedwell, they're gonna be evenly distributed all over. The other thing is that the flowers themselves are a more sort of lilac blue than a sky blue compared with Jamanda Speedwell. Jamanda Speedwell has really, really deep, intense blue flowers, um, whereas this is much more paler. There is another feature which is um, more variable, but the flowers are usually born on slightly longer leaf stalks as well. So there's a few other, obviously we didn't cover all 30 species for obvious reasons. Um, but I've just picked out a few additional ones that I thought would be useful just to, to briefly talk about. Um, so I put nettle leaf bellflower, but this is also applies for um, giant bellflower as well. Um, and I've said, are they more obvious or more unusual? So a lot of these ones are either very, very easy to identify, like in the cases of the bellflowers. If you've got giant bellflower or nettle leaf bellflower, you're probably going to find that it's quite obvious just because of those harebell-like flowers are so in your face, they're big plants. You'll probably take one flick through your book and be like, yep, yeah, that's the one I've got. There's a, a way of telling the difference between the two, which is essentially that nettle leaf bellflower is what's described as hispid, uh, which means, it's a bit of a funny word, isn't it? But it just means it's hairy, but kind of a bit bristly hairy. It's not softly hairy or downy, it's bristly hairy. Whereas giant bellflower is de definitely more sort of softly hairy. The other thing as well is that nettle leaf bellflower has stalks for the leaves, whereas giant bellflower doesn't. They sort of taper down to the base where they're clasping at the stem. So both these bellflower species are 
generally quite evenly distributed across the UK, um, but I would say they are quite local. You're not going to find it in your everyday wood. It's probably going to be your slightly better quality woodlands that you find these some of these species in. Climbing Cordalis, again, it's another one that, um, you know, it's well distributed across the UK, but it's not something I've come across much at all. Um, and that's possible because it's just quite locally distributed. Um, and it tends to prefer the sort of acid soil types or peaty soil types, um, which I haven't had. I don't have a lot um, where I was in Warwickshire, so I didn't see it. Um, heart's tongue it, uh, is one I've seen many times, but not often in woodlands. It does occur on woodland edges and in hedgerows, um, but it's also a grassland species. So you might find that you find it more in grassland. Um, but again, it can be rather local in its distribution, so not one of the really common ones you're likely to come across. Uh, common twy blade or twy blade, however you want to say it. Um, again, it's going to be in your slightly better quality woodlands, really, because uh, it tends to be where you've got other really interesting plants, maybe some other orchids, greater butterfly orchid, bee orchids, that sort of thing. Um, it's got those kind of classic uh, orchid like first leaves emerging kind of clasping each other but it only has that first pair of leaves and then it sends up its flower stalk after that and then lastly butcher's broom again you can often get it as a sort of planted one or the, you know escaped from gardens because it is a garden plant as well um, and again it's not a common one it's much more locally distributed so if you do need any help with any identification of any species then there are a few top tips that I like to suggest. So obviously you're going to want to take some photos, but really importantly, they need to be in focus. If they are blurry, it makes it incredibly difficult for anyone else to be able to identify them. Um, and you know, we want you to be able to send photos off to uh, you know, your local mentor or put it on the Facebook group for people to see, but you wanna take um, as good a photo as you can. And don't just take one photo, maybe take one of the flowers, one of an individual leaf, one of the whole plant, that sort of thing. So you can get a real feel of the plant, not just a single image. The other thing is to make a note of how it was growing. So when you were looking at it, did it feel like it was creeping along the ground or was it quite erect or was it sprawling in amongst other vegetation? All really important when it comes to finding out what species you have. What was the rest of the vegetation like? So what was around it? What other plants was it growing with? That can also be really helpful to somebody helping you with identification. And what were the growing conditions that it was in? Was it dry or was it in a wet bit of the wood where there was a sort of, um, you know, a pond or somewhere that was a bit damp? Or was it on sort of quite bare ground, meaning maybe it's one of those plants that comes in first and it sees an opportunity? Um, was it mossy, that sort of thing? and when you saw it, the time of year, and where you are in the country, or even within the county, because location uh, can have a massive uh, sort of impact on where species are likely to be found. So hopefully I've uh, left enough time now for some questions, and I haven't been looking at the chat or anything like that, so I'm hoping that Rachel's now going to come on air with me for a bit of a Q&A sesh, um, and we're gonna have some questions to go through. Hello. Um, thank you, Sarah. Actually, it's been incredibly quiet, I think, because we've all been thoroughly enjoying your presentation. <laughs> um, so I did have an initial um, question here from Catherine um, about um, if she should be recording tree seedlings um, in her woodland plots, to which I've already um, actually okay. responded. Um, I said, please do record them because they are species that are there and we are recording overall percentage coverage, of course. Um, because she did mention there's always a lot of them. So not asking you to count every single no. <laughs> um, seedling, but do record the percentage coverage, um, whether or not you think they, they may survive. Um, and do take note of that. You know, there is a comments box there on our recording form. So do take note of the fact that um, maybe, you know, a certain number of, of those that you've recorded were seedlings. Um, and that's absolutely fine. But yes, please do record them. So that was the one main question. I've also been just chatting to sue um about your um about finding you a square nearby so yes as we said definitely okay. do just be in touch um we have a little look ah here we go some questions are coming yeah. in now look so, so sarah there. let me read yeah. this um do you record the tree um some species themselves and give cover estimate 
Yes. Um, yes. So Initial essentially, taxa. yeah. So with uh, there's not a huge amount of tree species in the indicator. So it depends if you're recording at wildflower or indicator level. Um, but really, you've only got hazel, um, holly. Um, I'm just like reminding myself. That's why it's always useful to have your list. Um, and obviously, I mean, rhododendron is not really a tree, but um, whereas you're not actually recording the oaks and the ash because you've already established that what habitat it is, you're only looking for those species on the list to record. Um, so does that does that, does that make sense? So basically, if you've got ash and oak, then you're not actually recording those, which seems a bit a bit silly, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah that does answer let us know if there's anything else you'd like um us to talk on on that subject um i've also got another more of a note really from claire and claire i'm totally with you on this mm. claire said that she actually really struggles to take in focus photos um with her phone because of course we always talk about taking good photos and making sure they're in focus but that can actually be easier yeah. said than done i know um and she's asking about tips i mean the one main tip is is practice um but also getting out and, and just practicing looking at the different settings on your phone so sometimes there's different settings whether it's portrait mode or uh, you know various different modes and have a little bit of a play with it and um, before you actually head out on your on your um plot you know just when you're out and about and having a walk have a bit of a play with the different um settings on your phone going in and out tapping on the screen to zoom on those particular areas um if you have just got your phone to work with there any other tips you can think of sarah uh, sometimes one of the things that this uh cameras and phones can struggle with is actually finding something to focus in on because mm. there's a lot of vegetation and they're often the same colors and often you're dealing with low light conditions if you're in a woodland um, so one thing that can be useful is if you've got a, uh, a you know, your clipboard or even take a, a blank piece of paper that you can put behind the plant that you're taking a picture of. Um, so then at least it, you're sort of creating that that focus for your camera to actually sort of realize what you want. Um, and also just don't get too close. We can always be tempted, can't we? So we want to get some real detail. So we get really, really close to it and then expect our device to be able to just, you know, get a nice sharp image for us. But actually, it can't because it is just too close, in which case, just make sure you move your phone back a little bit more um, and always you can always use the digital zoom instead and just move in a bit closer yeah. that way. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, yeah, that is a good idea to having that that thing behind it so that your camera knows, as you say, what it what it is it's trying to focus on. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else, I suppose. One thing I would say is that I sort of it's a shame that, you, you know, I haven't been able to go through all the species, um, but it's just it would be you it would be such a flyby that you wouldn't actually gain anything from it. Um, but, you know, maybe next year when we do another woodland one, we'll sort of cover some of the other species or, you know, um, some of the other uh, some of the other ones are covered in my video that I did. Um, so, yeah, it's worth yeah. checking that out as well. Not so all I of have. <laughs> So I have popped um, the links for those actually in the chat box. If you take a little look at the chat box, I've popped in a link for um, Sarah's Dry Deciduous Woodland um, Habitat Habituation video. I've also popped in the one for Wet Woodland there as well, so I thought it was worth adding that. Um, and certainly just have a little look through our playlist as well. Actually, there's quite a lot there, but that's where you'll find, um, as I say, the Dry Deciduous and the Wet Woodland. And I think you're right, Sarah. I think we could talk about it all day, really, couldn't we? So there'll be definitely more opportunity um, in the next trading series to go into a bit more detail for some of the other species and the other thing to say is as well in the meantime don't struggle at all as Sarah's given us some really great tips on how to how to get advice so if there's anything you're not sure of um do take pictures note down descriptions and and we've got a number of resources that can help um whether it be the facebook support page the, the mentors or, or us so do ask yeah do do ask um the facebook group's great particularly for identification questions um, yeah. There's some some really great botanists on there that can that seem to be sort of there at a moment's notice to come back to, you know, and there, no question is too silly. No yeah. question is too silly. We all have to start somewhere. So um, I'm sure I asked a, a lot of random questions in the early days and I still do, actually. So there yeah, you go. There's no such thing as silly question. And actually, with the, the, the good thing with the Facebook um, group is as well. You're not just sending an email to one person. There's literally hundreds of people on there. There's many eyes offering opinions. So that's really, really useful. Um, let me have a little look, Jane. Uh, you've just typed something in there. Oh, she's done a survey, but most of the wood was full of nettles. 
so avoided them is that okay uh i'm i'm trying to sort of read between the lines here so uh, assuming you did do a plot in the woodland are we saying that the plot was set up where there wasn't lots of nettles um in which case I can kind of see your your thinking because obviously it's kind of I not very nice you know if you're doing it because basically you're going to get stung to pieces then absolutely you know we're with you this needs to be enjoyable um if it is accessible and you just were worried that it was such a horrible piece of woodland that we wouldn't want to know about it because it was full of nettles then that's a slightly different thing because we do actually want to know where there's a bit of nettly rubbishy woodland because you know, it all goes into that sort of important database. It doesn't mean look for them, but it needs to be as random as possible. But we don't want you getting completely stung to bits. So yeah, it, totally a judgment call here, I think. Well, that's it, it's weighing up, yeah, um, how much you'd actually like to keep going and returning to that plot because the consistency of data is really important. And if those oh, yeah. piles of nettles are going to put you off, yeah, then yes. It was, she was getting stung to pieces. Yeah. So yeah, oh, okay. fair, fair play. Um, so I'm assuming then there was another bit of wood that you were able to get to, um, potentially, uh, possibly. We're hoping so. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Okay. You said good, yes, good, lovely. Good. That's great. Brilliant. We're definitely, that's better than good option. Okay. Um, okay. Anything else, do we think? I can't see anything else popping up. But, yep. Good. Nobody else has got, gosh, that's all timed absolutely perfectly because I we're know. just coming towards the end of our session. We are indeed. So thank you ever so much, Sarah, for that. Um, and as Sarah said at the beginning, uh, a recording of this um, will be put onto the onto the YouTube channel if you want to go back and, and refer to this um, again at a later date or you can't quite remember something Sarah said. Um, so yes, you'll be able to access that very soon. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. And have thanks a good so afternoon. much, everybody, for joining. All right. Bye, everyone.